here. You know, it's been awesome as a church. We went through the book of Luke. Yeah. 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 Then we went through the book of Acts. And then we finally completed our first principles course. We're going to do that every autumn. Every autumn, we're going to take uh, those that are, are new to the movement, new to the church, new to Christianity, and walk them through the first principles. Not teaching them the first principles, but rather teaching how to teach the first principles. Yeah. Amen. That's how you grow as a Christian. Maturity is not determined by age. It's not determined yeah. by longevity or how long you've been in the church, but rather by your fruitfulness and your ability to teach other people to obey the Bible. Come on, bro. Every Sunday there are churches, thousands of them, that present the Bible. Yeah. The Bible is the Word of God. Even sure. if you don't know what you're doing, even if you don't have any faith, you can present the Bible. And it says that the Word of God never comes back empty. Wow. It Amen. always accomplishes its purpose. Right. But there is a, a vast difference between teaching the Bible and teaching somebody to obey the Bible. There's a, 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 a grand canyon of difference right there. Yeah. Come on, brother. That's what makes us different, Come is on. that we expect unquestioning obedience, not to any man, but rather to the Word of God. Amen. The hard part about that is the Bible is always presented by a man or a woman who is imperfect. Yeah. And it's not a question, you know, <coughs> discipling is the scariest thing in the world. Yeah. Discipleship, it, it, it's scary because you have to trust in God. Yep. Therefore, trusting in God, you'll be able to trust people who, not, it's not a question of if they'll hurt you, but when they'll hurt you and how bad they'll hurt you. Yeah. And then you'll be challenged and, and your Christianity will really be brought into the light to see whether or not you can forgive your brother or your sister from the heart. Right? So that's why we teach first principles. Now next fall, we're going to have a mature class. And that doesn't mean, hey, I've gone through first principles 30 times, so I get to go to the mature class, amen? I'm just bored with it. No, maturity is defined by fruitfulness. So if you ain't being fruitful, you ain't mature, you need to go back through first principles, amen? Come on, bro. Now for me, first principles, it's like Christmas. Christmas yeah. comes every August. I'm like, oh, it's so exciting. I love teaching the Bible. That's what it's all about. And it's going to be exciting as we see the church grow. Guys, this is very exciting. Yeah. 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 I want you to understand something. It's 2019. There you go. Uh, in one month, today's December 1st. I love the first of the month. Yeah. Yeah. You get paid. You know, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You collect a check. That's there you go. Encouraging, right? You say, you say, it's the first of the month. It's a, it's a reset. It's a restart for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> it's December, the best month of the year. Yes. Come on. We're about to go in, in 31 days, to 2020. Yeah. 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 It's the beginning of a new decade. Yeah. It's 2020, the year of vision. Yeah. yeah. To see God do something yeah. awesome in your life. you got to have great vision. I want to challenge us going into the new year to start preparing yourself. Come on. To compile a list of, of at least 10 personal goals. I would say 12, amen, because that's, that's an awesome number. There's 12 yeah. To start thinking about what your kingdom dream is. Come on. You know what's awesome is today we've uh, started to collect the toys for our Mercy Toy Drive, amen? Yeah. Somebody's going to be a really happy guy, amen? Yeah. I say, okay, if you forgot to, to bring your toy, don't fret. You can still get it tonight to your Bible Talk leader, amen? And, and we see that, that God's already doing something special. It's an exciting time. You know, we've got uh, Marley, he's got his Mercy shirt on. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, all right, Marley. Marley, 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 Marley. Marley. You say, you know what's awesome? All of us are Mercy Ambassadors. There you go. We became a Mercy Ambassador the day you got baptized, amen? Wow. And it's awesome to have Maria here. She got baptized on Sunday. You say, hey, bro, what's your kingdom dream? You say, to be a mercy ambassador. Well, you already are. That dream's fulfilled. How about we get another kingdom dream that challenges you to grow? The Bible says that without vision, the people perish. Here's what a kingdom dream is. It makes you nervous to say it out loud. That's how I define a kingdom dream. You say, well, I want to be a full-time ministry. That's scary. Because wow. once you say that, what are you open to now? You're vulnerable. You're open to disappointment. Amen. You're open to rejection. 
You're open to failure. That's what it means to dream big. Come on, bro. Yeah, it says if you uh, shoot for the moon, you land on the stars. Yeah. But the stars are actually farther than the moon, amen? So if you shoot for the stars, you land on the moon, amen? Yeah. Come on. It's actually, and it's incredible because God wants us to dream big. God wants us to have a vision. God wants you to live in a way that scares you. When Jesus resurrected from the dead in Matthew 28, it says that the, the, the sisters, because it was the women that found him first, amen? Yeah. Yeah. The sisters, let's just be honest, they're more spiritual than us, God. There you go, there you go. It's true. We can't make any, any we can't mince words, amen? And it says that they left afraid yet filled with joy. Mm. Kind of like, it was just a thrilling moment. They saw Jesus resurrected, but they were somewhat apprehensive about what this would mean for their lives. <laughs> and I want that to define our year in 2020. But you got to start now. You, you, you can't wait for December 31st. You, you can't go. wait for January 1st. you got to start to really prepare yourself spiritually yep. for what's going to happen next year. It's there going go. to be the best year of our lives. Yeah. One thing that's key is that we have the best friends of all time. Yeah. And that's the time. Title of the lesson for today, amen. Yeah. Oh, come on. Woo! Best friends of all time. Here's yeah. the reality: we need each other. Yeah. We can't do this on our own. First point: love one another. Go to John chapter 13. Oh, John 13. Verse 34 to 35. Jesus here is at the Last Supper. He's got the 12 apostles there. Judas is there. Amen. Amen. He washes Judas' feet. He knows who Judas is and how he's been given over to Satan's will. Mm -hmm. This is a guy who hates generosity because he's greedy. Mm -hmm. So he hates things like special missions contribution. Wow. Wow. And it says when the woman broke the alabaster jar of perfume, which was about a year's wages, he, yeah. he was angry about it and then cloaked his greed in concern for the poor. Oh, wow. Wow. You see, when we get unspiritual, we start to cloak our sin in like a spiritual concern mm -hmm. because the line between wisdom and worldliness is oftentimes very blurry. Yeah. And what is worldliness can sometimes look like wisdom and what is wisdom can sometimes seem like you're losing your zeal. But at the end of the day, we know that Judas cloaked his greed and this concern for the poor. But really, he was the keeper of the money bag and used to help himself to what was put into it. Amen. Now that's a challenge for us right there because Jesus put Judas the thief in charge of the money. Yeah. That's the, he was making a statement right there. Yeah. He was saying, listen, God is in control. Yeah. It doesn't matter what Judas is doing. It doesn't matter what other people are doing around you. God is in control. Isn't that awesome? Because when you know that God is in control, you can live a life full of joy. You can live a life full of peace. You can totally trust in God that the good, the bad, and even the ugly, God allowed it to happen or he made it happen to get you closer to be prepared to go to heaven. Amen. Any good thing happen to you this week? Yeah. yeah. Any yeah. bad thing happen to you this week? Sure. Yeah. Anything, even just downright ugly, just downright, yeah. maybe it was your own sin yeah. that you sure. started to face in the mirror. He said, I'm an ugly man. I'm an ugly person because of what I've done. I've got to deal with that. God allowed it to happen. Yeah. Because maybe if it didn't happen, you'd be too prideful to be sitting in this room this morning. Oh, come on. See, to be a disciple in God's kingdom, you got to be humble, amen? amen? To hang out with us, we're not that awesome. You gotta be humble. Come on, bro. I mean, Marley's a humble guy. Oh, That's why he was able to become a disciple. Yeah. Lisa's a humble lady. That's why she was able to become a disciple. If you come in here prideful, you'll start to think that you're better than other people. Really, what you think is that you're better than Jesus. Yeah. Come on, bro. Because who did Jesus hang out with? The prostitutes and the tax collectors. Yeah. He hung out with the sinners. He would have hung out with the likes of you and me. That's right. He said, these are my people. These are the people that see their need. These are the people that get it. Yeah. Come on. And here he is at the Last Supper. After washing Judas' feet. And listen to what he says in verse 34. Come on, Dave. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What is Jesus all about? He says there's an exclusive command here. 
We know in Matthew 22, 37 to 40, it says you got to love your neighbor as yourself. you got to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> and you say, who's your neighbor? Everybody. Amen? Yeah. This is a different command because it's exclusive to the disciples. He says, in this group, at this table, this brotherhood, this sisterhood, you need to love one another to the extent that I have loved Come on. Amen. Come on. It says, you know, it's not, you know, you've heard people say, well, I love you, I just don't like you. That doesn't count, amen? You, you got to love your brother and your sister, and you got to like your brother and your yeah. sister. Amen? Yeah. There are people that you naturally click with. That's, that's good. You, you might find, like, man, we're the same kind of person. We like the same kind of things. There's compatibility right there. But it says, even with those that you might not naturally click with, it says you got to love that person. You gotta be grateful for that person. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm gonna be. Can I be honest? Yeah. Yes. yeah. I'm gonna disciple the brothers a little bit. Amen. Oh. Well, I discipled them on Thanksgiving and said, "You guys are prideful," mm -hmm. and they admitted that it was true. Very competitive. Amen. We were playing basketball. Amen. <laughs> God has protected me. He's insulated me from pride in that area. I'm sorry in basketball. Oh, Amen. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And I was trying to figure out what the issue was. And we're a family, so we're gonna talk about this, right? We're gonna bring yeah, it on yeah. the table. And my wife. Nailed it. She said, there's just a lack of gratitude. Oh, said, That's what it is. Mm -hmm. There's a lack of gratitude. When you're grateful yeah. for your salvation, when you understand how little you deserve, you don't deserve it at all. When you realize, man, God has, has, has placed me in an awesome territory. He's, he's extended my boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. My life is great. Great. Yeah. That's right. You not only do you get grateful for God, you get grateful for your brothers. Yeah. You get grateful for your sisters. You're excited to serve them. Here, Jesus says you gotta love one another the way that I have loved you. Believe it or not, Jesus was grateful for the guys. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm here as one who serves. I mean, he says, actually, in John, right before this, 13. If you pick it up there, it says it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. You know, it's incredible. Jesus, in this moment, knows that he had been given all authority. That he had come from God, he was going back to God. Why? Because he was God. Yeah. yeah. He says his, his, his first act here, knowing that he's going to be the supreme being, was to take off his outer clothing, which would leave him vulnerable, so he'd be left only with his inner tunic. And he takes a towel, wraps it around his waist, gets down on his knees, and washes his disciples' feet. Wow. Maybe even beginning with Judas. Yeah. Isn't that powerful? Yeah. yeah. That's how we have to love That's right. one another. Why do I publicly admonish the brothers? Mm -hmm. Because they're going to be leaders of men. Amen. Amen. Dozens of men. Hundreds of men. Maybe even thousands wow. of men. Come on. It's just, it's, this is not to put anybody down, but rather to build a fire under us so that we can answer the call that God has laid amen. out in Come on, scriptures bro. through amen. discipling. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. This is the level of love. You gotta love one another. Hebrews chapter 12, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. Come on, brother. All right. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 to 14. We've got to be grateful for one another. Verse 12 it says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful and believing heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, right here. It says that it's our responsibility to make sure that the brothers and the sisters don't have a sinful and unbelieving heart. That's right. That turns away from the living God. You know what's right. incredible? It's our, our movement. Not only do we move geographically, amen? Yeah. You know, it's incredible because we had our, uh, our South Asia Missions Conference yeah. just a couple of weeks yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to see hundreds of disciples gather in Delhi. And to know that we've got our church in New Delhi, we've got our church in Kathmandu, we've got our church in Amen. Chennai, we've got our church in Bangalore, to all come oh, together. And on that Sunday service, there were 33 baptisms. Oh, wow. Wow. Now, what's remarkable about that is Raja and Debs Rajan 
came out of our former fellowship to begin a remnant group in Chennai yeah. with just a few people yeah. to see now that there are nearly 400 disciples on the wow. southern continent of India is just incredible. And you know what? I mean, we get to partake in that because that's a part of our world sector, the that's sages. Right. Amen. What does sages stand for? South Asia, South Asia, Asia, Gulf and Eastern States, amen? So we, we get to take care of India. We get to consider what is happening. We're directly connected to that going on down there. That's incredible to see what happened in Sydney, Australia, because right before that conference in Delhi, there was the conference in Sydney, the Austro-China yeah. conference. And to see what Joe and Carrie Willis have done there, they've been there for, awesome. I think, uh, since 2014. It's been about five years. But to see all the Chinese disciples. Amen. I mean, they really got the Asian persuasion going on. Yeah. 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 We're not too far behind. We, we've got Mary, Kim, and Ralph right there. Yeah. The Asian persuasion. And then you see, I mean, just incredible people coming to faith in Jesus. Some of them being severely persecuted because of their atheistic background. Coming to China, China. We've got our church led by Dean Lam there in Hong Kong. Yeah. Now, now the other churches in China, we can't even mention the names of the leaders yeah. or the cities that they reside in. We call them Crouching Tiger One. Oh yeah. 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 Crouching Tiger Two. Yeah. Yeah. And at the end of the conference in Sydney, we sent out Crouching Tiger yeah. Number Two. Yeah. God is doing. I mean, I don't know about you, I want to go to Sydney and meet all those disciples. Yeah. And you know where you're going to find there? Of course, we know uh, We know Jerry, Joe and Carrie Willis. We know yeah. some of the other leaders there, the Valenzuela brothers and all that. But to see all those baby Christians, those new disciples that have come to faith. You know, it's incredible. There in Manila, we've got Ricky Covey Chalinor. Yeah. Yeah. Church has grown by almost a hundred this year. Amen. Just baptizing wow. dozens and dozens and dozens of people. One of one of the uh, the young disciples that were that was baptized, a teen girl, was severely persecuted because she comes from what is the kind of uh, ISIS-controlled part of the Philippines. Mm. She was physically beat by her sister. The disciples that were present outside of her home were also physically abused by their family, one of them being Carlos Robielos, who I know very well. Yeah. And she was, she was taken out of Manila, sent back to her homeland, but she stayed in contact. They even took her Bible away. She's staying connected, watching sermons, and then at her school, her teacher gave her a Bible oh so she could have quiet time when she got to class. Wow. She stayed there. Wow. You see, that's what God is doing. We, we're moving geographically. We've got our church right here in the Greater Tampa Bay. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta get a vision for Florida, amen. There you go. That's they say, wow, it's so exciting. But not only do we move geographically, we move doctrinally, theologically. What does that mean? If the Bible says something that we're not doing, we're going to change That's our right. idea and do what the Bible says. That's right. yeah. Yeah. But we're not dogmatic. We're, we're not the religious. We're spiritual. We're religiously devoted to Jesus as our Lord. Yeah. That's right. We follow him as disciples. So the Bible presents something to us. It's not like, well, that's not the way it happened for me. It doesn't matter how it happened with you. The only thing that was important is that you studied the Bible, you repented of your sins, you obeyed, you made Jesus Lord of your life, because when you got baptized, you said, Jesus is Lord. And you became a disciple when you got baptized. All your sins are forgiven. You say, well, what's God doing now? That never changes. But you see, the Bible moves us. Yep. The Word of God is living and active. We've got to be physically, or excuse me, spiritually fit. Come on, brother. Physically fit's good too. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 2020 goals right there. Come on. We've got, we got to be spiritually nimble. Yeah. The scriptures say that the men of Israel knew the times and they knew what God's people should do. Yeah. You need to be guided by the Spirit Come in on. your life. Amen. You know, the Holy Spirit that you get at baptism is like a compass. You know how compasses work? Yeah. Yep. By the magnetic field of the earth, and they always show you true north. Yeah. Amen. If you've got the Holy Spirit because you were studied with, you repented of your sins, you were made into a disciple, you were baptized as a disciple, you, your sins are forgiven, you got to get to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now it says that Spirit will guide you. What's the magnetic force? It's the Word of God. Come on. Amen. 
You yeah. see, the, the, yeah. the word of God, right. Ephesians 6, says it's the sword of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that directs your heart and your thinking, empowered by the Spirit itself. But without the Bible, you're kind of left wondering and wandering. Amen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the word of God and the Spirit of God that direct you to know what you ought to do in your life, to stay spiritually nimble, mm -hmm. to stay spiritually fit, to know what God is calling you to on, do today. Now, if there's confusion in your life, I'll tell you where it comes from. It comes from sin. Come on, brother. Is it easy to walk around in the dark? It's hard. You come into the light by confessing your sins so that you can That's see right. what God is doing yeah. in your life. Yeah. It says that we've got to see to it that none of us has a sinful and unbelieving heart that turns away from the word of God. That's yeah. right. That turns away from the compass, showing us north. Yeah. But because we're not in our Bibles, we're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. Um, no, there's nothing like reading the Bible. The Bible will inconvenience your life. Yeah. Yeah. You thought it was going to make everything nice and fluffy. Yeah. But in reality, Jesus came to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. And you know when you haven't had some great time with God in the, in the Word, it's because you're a bit afraid of what you're going to have to do once you start reading it. Come on, brother. Because you know once you start reading it, you're going to have to obey it. There it is. But you know what? It's fail-proof. Every time you really read the Scriptures, if you need advice on where to go, get some. Amen? Amen. Every time you really read the Scriptures and you obey it, what happens? Man, you just feel so fired up. Come on, bro. Are you fired up this morning? Come on, bro. Are you filled with zeal this morning? Come on, bro. You cannot manufacture it. You cannot fabricate it. You cannot fake the funk. That's right. Come on, bro. If you're a hypocrite, you're going to try to look like you're fired up, but you're not really fired up for the Word of God, and it's going to fall every time. Why do you keep getting into sin? Because you're not reading the Bible every day. You know, we just had Thanksgiving, and I ate it until I couldn't eat anymore. We had Dini over for Thanksgiving, and I saw him going for the apple pie and the ice cream and the whipped cream. I said, Dini, no, don't do it. And then he caught me with the pecan pie. He said, you eat one piece of pecan after another. You eat one piece of pumpkin after another. You eat one piece of apple pie. You put on the ice cream. You even wash it down with some eggnog. You watch the Cowboys lose. Yeah. You wake up, you're hungry again. He said, God is trying to teach you something. That you need to rely on Him every single That's right. day. Amen. If Come I on. offered you a scrumptious meal today, you say, no, I'm fine, I ate yesterday. No, you eat every day. That's right. Yeah. Unless you're fasting, amen. amen. You see, from the scriptures, we've got to eat every day. Turn Come your on. Bible to Ezekiel. Amen. Come on, God. Come on. Come on. Right here, in Ezekiel chapter 3, this is Ezekiel's calling as a prophet. Yeah. And you know, all of us as disciples are prophets and prophetesses. Amen? Come on, bro. We can't tell the future, but we can tell the truth. Ooh. And he says, he said to me, this is the angel, son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the house of Israel. You see, some of us, we, we don't share our faith the way we know we ought to. You know why that is? Because you're not eating the way you know you ought to. Come on. When you eat the scroll, man, you have something to say. Yeah. Come on. And when you're out at Publix, you have something to say to the person at the cash register. Come on. Yeah. When you're out at Burlington Coal Factory or at Best Buy during Black Friday Come on. or maybe tomorrow during Cyber Monday, yeah. you've got something to say. Come on. Yeah. And it's not, wow, what a great deal. You say, what a great salvation. Let me share this with you, my friend. There you, go. you see, consumerism can't get you to heaven, but Jesus will. There you go. You see, man, I, I ate on, good bro. this morning. I ate good. And when you eat something good, don't you talk about it? That's right. When Rachel and I live in Mexico City, we just, every time, like, everybody knows where the best taco spot is. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, no, 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 these are the best tacos. Oh, these are the best tacos. Even I got it to know you're going to vote. These are the best tacos. Let me take you there. And when you talk about it, you share about it. It's just on your heart. When you eat the word of God, you say, man, I got something to say. Yeah. I can't keep it to myself. That's right. It's like a fire shut in my bones. I got to talk about it. That's right. I might not be that good at talking. I might not be that good of a salesperson. I might not be that good. I might be awkward. Amen. I, I, I might be uncomfortable. I might even weird people out. Fret not. God can 
use you. And if you are not being used by God, it's because you don't want to. And God can use the rocks and the trees That's to right. speak His word. Come on, brother. He can use any one of us That's right. to make a huge impact, not only in the lives of our family and friends and loved ones, but in the lives of complete strangers that become family. Yeah. He says, eat this scroll and then go and speak. So verse 2, I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. So I made the scroll, I'm giving you to fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey mm -hmm. in my mouth. He said, it was just phenomenal. Come on. It was just awesome. I mean, it was yeah. so <laughs> precious yeah. to me. Go to Psalm chapter 119. All right, bro. All right, bro. All right. Chapter 19 in the book of Psalms. You guys still with me? Come on, bro. Yeah. Let's go, bro. In verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Wow. It says God's wow. commands, God's word, God's law is perfect and flawless. Right. It's worth more than gold, Amen. than much pure gold. Amen. Come on. If I gave you much pure gold, I don't know how to quantify that. Let's say it was a lot. Yeah. It says, if I had a choice between the word of God and much pure gold, I take the word of God every single time. Come on. Come on. If I have to move for the movement, I move yeah. every single time. Come on. Yeah. Come on. If I have to crank for the Lord, I crank every single time. If I sacrifice for God and for the word, I sacrifice every single on, time. Bro. Why? Because it's flawless. Come on, bro. It's perfect. It's sweeter than the sweetest. Come on. Thing. This, this is how we love one another. You eat the scroll, and then you speak the scroll. Come on, bro. You get close to God, so you can get close to one another. You know, Ephesians 2, 19 to 21, talks about being in the family of God. Mm -hmm. And we kind of draw this pyramid for people. You say, here's God the Father. There mm -hmm. is. And then there's a, a Christian. He's a son of God. Yeah. Another Christian. He's right. a son of God. What does that make those two guys? Brothers. Brothers. Yeah, brothers. So he's talking about the sisters that are sisters. So we say, hey, bro, it's more than just a, a saying or a phrase that we like to use. Yeah. It's not to remain relevant, amen? Yeah. <laughs> it's to say, hey, you're my brother. We're family. Yeah. And the person that you find, there's a pyramid as you get closer to God. At that altitude, who you find there, that's who you stick with. Mm -hmm. That's who you stick with. That's called pure day. You know, we believe in pure day. Amen. Come on. Come on. We believe as, as brothers and sisters that when we get together and you, you know, that special sister catches your eye. You, oh. you want to start going, as we used to call it, going steady. Amen. Yeah. You yeah. say, man, you know, there's purity there that, that remains intact as long as you're close to God. Mm -hmm. You know, it's incredible in our movement over the last 12 years. As long as both spouses have stayed faithful to Jesus as a disciple, we That's haven't right. had a single divorce. Amen. 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 That's right. So people, when people leave Jesus, you, you know, that's a yep. different story. That's right. We just got to love one another. We're going to talk a little bit about that here at the end. Point number two, edify one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. You know, we've got to speak to each other only what builds up and edifies the body. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. One of the greatest edifying factors we have in our church are marriages. Come on. Yeah. We've got our marriage Devo coming up on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. In verse 39, here's what it says. A woman is bound to her husband as long as she lives. But if her husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes. But he must belong to the Lord. You see, what's marriage defined by the Bible? It's when one disciple marries another disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, you're not a Christian if you're not a disciple. Why? Because Jesus never used the word Christian when defining what it would mean to be his follower. Yeah. He used the word disciple, which shows up in the gospel 270 times. So every time Jesus is talking to a crowd, he says, if you want to be my follower, if you want to be my disciple, you'll do X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C. Turn left and turn right, give up this, give up that. 
Luke 14, 33 says, give up everything. Yeah. He said, now, seven years after Jesus established his church in 29 AD, in the city of Antioch, they were called, the disciples were called Christians for the first time. So it was like a nickname given. So we have an equation. that a disciple equals Christian equals saved. If you're not a disciple according to the scriptures, you're not a Christian Come on. according to the scriptures. Come right on, there, man. It's never been enough to simply believe. Right. Yeah. Belief is only where we begin. Jesus himself in John 8, 31 to 32 says to those who had believed him, he said, if you hold to my teachings, then you're really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Come on. Amen. You see, once you believe, that's a great place to start. Yeah. The second step is to obey. Come on. Then you'll know the truth, and then the truth will set you free. Amen? Come on. Says you got to believe. The only place in the Bible where the phrase faith alone shows up is in James chapter 2, and it says faith alone does not save you. Wow. wow. So if anybody tells you, you faith alone, yeah, tell them it doesn't save you. You're not justified by your belief system. You're justified by your obedience yeah. to the word of God. Amen. Faith without deeds, faith without obedience is dead. Yeah. Come on. Are you with me? Yeah. So how do we edify one another? When two disciples decide to commit to each other. Cool. Of course, we find that there's no greater example than in marriage. Come on. And I think it's interesting because marriage is the most vivid illustration that we have of the relationship between Jesus and the church. Mm -hmm. And I actually think it was that relationship that began first. Jesus, God is outside of time. Amen, guys? Amen. Amen. You get a little bit of a theology right here. So God created time. Yes. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense to say God is old because God was never born. Nor will he ever die. Try to wrap your, you know, that'll Come make on. your noodle right there. Come on, right? Right. God, God created space. So he's not big, nor is he small. But everything that we measure is determined by time and space. True. How old is it? How big is it? Yeah. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. He said God created those things. So God has written out every page of your life. Wow. Why? Because he saw it all happen already. Come on. He sees the timeline. He sees your life, but you're still walking it. Yeah. You know what's incredible is that you still choose what you do in your life every day. Wow. Yeah. But he already saw you choose it. Wow. Because he's outside of all of that. He created time. It's a construct that he made up. Yeah. Yeah. He is the beginning and the end, the Come alpha on. and the omega. So every day you choose the way that your life will turn out. Every day you sow seeds, and the seeds you sow today, you will reap tomorrow. Come yeah. on, bro. It's a universal principle that cannot be changed. Come on, bro. God is not a liar. He doesn't change his mind like you and me. That's he right. says, what you do will turn out for your betterment or for your endangerment Come on. tomorrow. Come on, no matter what. You can't change it. Even if you get emotional, God is not a bouncer at a club. So when you show up on Judgment Day, he's not going to say, oh, come on in, because he likes you. Yeah. Come on, bro. Nor is he emotional, because imagine, the Bible says we were created in his image, right? Yeah. Are you emotional? Yeah. yeah. Have any bad days every once in a while? Sure. Yeah. What if on Judgment Day you go there and God's having a bad day? It's just oh, all oh, downstairs. Oh, no, we would have liked that, right? <laughs> so God says, don't worry. You're judged by my word. Amen. I'm not going to judge you arbitrarily. The word is set. you got to do what it says. If you do what it says, you're, you're, you'll get off scot -free. Come on. Because as disciples, we go through our judgment here and now. Yeah. So that we don't face judgment on that last day. Amen. But we're led into heaven. Isn't Come that going to be awesome? That's right. Where Jesus has prepared a place for us to be. That's right. But he says, you've got to choose today what you're going to do as a disciple. You know, it says here that marriage is in the Lord. So it, he created that relationship and then invented the idea of a man and a woman being married. Wow. To teach us about how to act in the church. Come on, bro. You see, when people get sentimental and they start making decisions based on what the people in their lives want, instead of what God wants, they misunderstand the concept of family. Yeah. You see, your physical family is, the spiritual family doesn't teach you about the physical family. The physical family teaches you about the spiritual family. Mm -hmm. The spiritual family was first. He gave you a mom and a dad and brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles to teach you how to behave in God's kingdom. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that intense? Come on. So what does Luke 14 say? It says, you know what, I don't want you to think hey, I'm misquoting hey. it. Let's go to Luke 14, hey, amen. There you go, some of you are about to start. No, nah, it doesn't say that. Uh, Luke 14, it does. Yeah. Come on, bro. Come on. Can I get a witness? Come on, bro. Yeah. 
It says here in Luke chapter 14, verse 25, large crowds are traveling with Jesus and turning to him and said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. It says these people need to take a second place in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because they're the ones that could potentially influence you the most. Mm -hmm. Your husband or your wife. Yep. They're not, if they're not faithful to Jesus, they're going to try to pull you away. Yeah. Yep. They're going to try to condemn your behavior because they feel condemned themselves. Come on. Your, your mom and dad. Your brother, your sister, your, maybe even your own kids, depending on the situation. But really the hardest person to put as secondary is yourself. Yeah. It says, you, you, you see, Jesus calls us to put those people secondary because he is number one no matter what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus is our creator. So your mom and your dad, you know, they had something to do with it, but they didn't create you. Yeah. Come on. Does your father have creative abilities? Can he make life out of nothing? Nope. No. You know, at the end of the day, science as it advances atheistic science that tries to say that there's no God, where traditionally you go back a little while and you'll find that every real scientist, of course, believed in God, a rational God, because everything in life essentially can be proved. How could it be accidental? Yeah. Think yeah. about Newton, the law of physics. This was a devoutly religious man. Are you with me? Yeah. Come on. He said, okay, atheistic science will try to tell you that God does not exist. <laughs> And I completely lost my train of thought. I forgot why I brought all that up. Amen. Good, but at the end of the day, we got to be disciples. Amen. So you say, okay, well, my family, I love them, but who do I owe my life to? Just okay, here's where I was going with it. <laughs> Science, as it advances, cannot make life out of nothing. Yeah. Artificial intelligence, it's a computer. Cool. It can do comp com computations. Did I say that right, Marvin? Yeah. Okay, good. It's, no, it, it, it can do really complicated math algorithms and, and like uh, arrive at a, at a conclusion based on numbers. Great. But can it make life? No. Can you go outside and focus until a flower pops out no. of the soil? No. <laughs> so does your dad have the ability to create you? The Bible says that you were perfectly and wonderfully made. created. Yeah. Wow. You were fearfully made. If you have curly hair, God was like, that's perfect for that person. Oh. There you go. If you've got freckles, that was perfect for that person. If you're balding, that was perfect. <laughs> oh my God. I'm going to put them in the Tampa Bay International Christian Church, all those balding brothers. <laughs> Don't, don't put us to shame. Keep your hair, amen? But if you're like Ralph, just shave it off, amen? Don't, don't join our club. We only want those that are truly bald, amen? We don't want any hypocrites. Uh, sorry, sorry, you were born with, with those genes, amen? This is God. God creates you perfectly. Who do you owe your life to? Who do you owe your decision to? Who should you be sentimental towards? The Father. Your creator. He made your face. He made you in every way that you are. Yep. You owe him. That's right. That's how you make decisions. Yeah. That's how you live your life. You say, my, my father is calling. God is calling me. God is calling each and every one of us today. Come on, bro. Edify one another. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're bringing it in for a landing here. Come on, bro. Hope I haven't lost you. Keep going, bro. Come on. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Yeah, Second Corinthians chapter six. Yeah. It says in verse fourteen, "Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Mm -hmm. For what do righteousness <laughs> and wickedness have in common? <laughs> what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Mm -hmm. What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? Mm -hmm. For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them." And I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing. Yeah. I'll receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. You know, the Bible says that, that we shouldn't be yoked together with unbelievers. Come on. No matter what, relationships either grow or die. Yeah. So there's no way that you can flirt with the world. If you're flirting with the world, if you love the world, you hate God. Come on. If you love God, you hate the world. You can't serve two masters. 
you either love the one and despise the other, or you yeah. love the one and hate the other. It's a, it's God, it's everything, or it's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to be yoked together. You know, in our church, we believe in pure dating. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. We, we believe in righteous marriage, where two disciples of Jesus decide to come together. Why? To build God's church. Amen. Amen. And to enjoy the, the marital bliss. The awesomeness of marriage. It's awesome being there. That's right. Yeah. Amen. And I invite Woo! all of you who are single to pray to God to find a godly spouse. There you go. I don't forget hearing Michael Williamson preach in 2009. He said, I married the woman that God wanted for me. It was almost like, the way he said it was like, I was like, that's interesting. Like, they look great. They're like models, both of them. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, what did you? Was she your second choice, bro? And, I was like, and, 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 and you can be deceived as a human being. We, we, we actually kind of like to be deceived. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things. There's nothing more deceitful than the thing that beats in your chest. Come on. It literally is begging. Like, your feelings are stupid. Amen? I'm not saying, like, you're stupid. I'm not saying I don't care about how you feel. I'm just saying your sentiments, your emotions... They need to borrow intellect from your mind to validate themselves. Do so you know how you feel like crummy sometimes? Yep. Yeah. You just feel, you ever just wake up and you're just like, oh man, you know, I feel like it's, yeah. man, it's just kind of a bummy day. And then you, you, you validate that with your thinking, you're like, yeah, because you're lazy. Oh, you're right. You're impure. You're, you're right. And you beat yourself down. You say, oh, you're not good enough. Yeah, you're right. You beat yourself down. You're not pretty enough. Boom. You're, you're, you're sick. Boom. You're this, boom, you're that, you're unfaithful. And Satan pulls you away. Yeah. Yep. And this is how he gets us. Come on. He say, you know what? God sees you the way that you are with all your faults and loves you that way. Yeah. He calls you that way so that he can change you into his image. Yeah. It says here, you can't be yoked with unbelievers. Your feelings need validation from your thinking. Don't give them that. Think, the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. Right. And we can have power over our moods. Come on, yeah. We can right. stay connected. It right. says that, that as disciples, we marry, we date and marry disciples. That's right, amen. Come we on, get bro. together and we fight the good fight. You say, you know what? We have, we have awesome families in God's kingdom. Yeah. Come on. We have awesome kids. Some people will not get married. They have the gift of Paul, Amen. Amen. Say that so they can be give undivided devotion to the Lord right there, Amen. and that's good. Better for it, Amen. Amen. But but many of us say, man, God is calling us. Now this is to teach us how to operate in relationships, even that are like not marriage. To say just friendships in the church, how to behave with one another, yeah. How to treat one another. It says, be pure, yeah. Come into the light. Yeah. Do not be yoked with unbelievers. Amen. Amen. In the Old Testament, people that, that intermarried with those that were not of the nation mm -hmm. of Israel says that they were led astray to worship yeah. false gods. Yeah. Yeah. Solomon himself, this guy had 300 wives and 700 concubines. Yeah. Wow. I mean, this guy was in over his head. Yeah. Yeah. And what happened? He was led astray to worship other <laughs> false gods. Because of the women that he yoked himself to. Yeah. So you got to lead people. Relationships either grow or they die. <coughs> they don't stay stagnant. So I want to encourage us on, to bro. grow in the right way. Amen? That's right. Yeah. Edify one another. Respect one another. Be grateful That's for right. each other. Yeah. Point number three as we close out. Win one another. Go to Matthew chapter 18. Okay. Now what's inevitable in God's church is that there's conflict. And we're masters at resolving that conflict. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Matthew chapter 18. It says here in verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. The Bible gives us the perfect prescription for conflict resolution. You know what? At the end of the day, there's no doghouse in God's house. Yeah. Come on. We're in the business of forgiveness. Amen? Amen. It says if somebody sinned and you see that sin, you can see it clearly. It says you should go point out their fault. Now that can be easily misconstrued as go and let them know what's up. No. Come on, bro. And this is this is a powder cake. You can go in there and, and misspeak or misstep, and there's an explosion. 
You ever yep. try to correct somebody in Boy. something that you see and it not quite go the way that you yeah. thought it would? Yeah. yeah. And then you just say, well, they're unspiritual. They should just be humble and listen to me. Well, who are you? Yeah. They said, what's your, how do you do this? What's the, what's the prescription? It says, you got to go and win your brother or your sister over. So say I see somebody sin. I see Marvin sin. I say, Marvin, what are you doing? Now I'm allowed to talk like that to Marvin, amen, because he's my, my, my son in the faith right there. Amen. 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 You knucklehead, you know, he's like my little brother. And I give him a noogie. They say, if, if, if he feels super deeply hurt by me or disrespected or something like that, is that an effective way to win him over? No. no. They say, bro, I can't believe you did this. You start kicking stuff over, you know, you, 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 you're condescending, you speak down to people or whatever. Is that going to win them over? No. no, it doesn't win them over. It's not really about winning them over for you. It's more about just being right. Yeah. But the Bible calls us to be righteous over being right. Come on. Jesus was, was proved wrong, and when he was accused, he made no defense. Mm -hmm. He didn't care about being right. He cared about be remaining righteous Amen. and took on the crucifixion for us. You say, how do you win somebody over? You say, hey, bro, say somebody's hurt. Now, when you get mad, how do you know you've been hurt? Because you're mad about it. Yeah. You say, I'm mad at this brother, mad at this sister. I've been hurt. You say, hey, bro, I just want to talk to you. When you said this, it really hurt my feelings. And I want to apologize to you because I've been harboring some bitterness and some, some resentment. Please forgive me. Mm. Yep. You think that's effective at winning them over? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Really effective. As When somebody talks to you like that, you're like, no, 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 no. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry. He yes. says you, you speak up to one another. Amen. You edify one another. You build each other up so that you can win one another over. Come on, bro. This is the call for us as Christians. To resolve any conflict here within so that we can win the world Amen. outside. That's right. Amen. So this is, this is how we do it. What is it going to take? What's, what's our greatest witness? What's our greatest strength and our greatest power to evangelize the nations of this generation? Our love one for another. There you, go. you say to have the greatest year of, of our lives in 2020, we need the best friends of all time. Amen. Come on. You know what that means is that you got to love one another. On. You got to edify one another. And you got to win one another. Amen? Amen. I love you guys very much. And to God, Amen. to the Lord.